The diagram shows the outline of a racetrack for skaters, which consists of two long straight sections and two semicircular turns. Given the dimensions shown, which of the following most closely measures the perimeter of the entire track? Well, they've given us that this length here is 150 yards, apparently, since all of our answers are in yards. So that means that this opposite straight side here would also be 150 yards. And actually, just from that amount of information, we can already start eliminating some answers. I know that 180 yards is definitely not enough because I've got 150 and 150. So we're going to have to skate this 150, skate some more, skate another 150, and skate some more. So we know we're already over 180 yards. We also know it's going to be more than 300 yards because just the two straight sections are 300 yards. So we can already eliminate that answer choice. And we're down to these three possibilities. So that means we need to figure out what this distance is here and here. They told us that these were semicircular turns. That means that semi, that semi means half of a circle. So if you take these two halves of a circle and you put them together, you get one whole circle. So really they're traveling the distance of one whole circle in addition to these straight sides here, which means we need to find the circumference of our circle to find the distance around the circle. That's what circumference is. And the circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter of the circle, which they gave us. They told us that this distance is 30. Well, that goes all the way across my circle. So that's my diameter. So my circumference is 30 pi. And pi is about 3. It's actually a little over 3. But since they said most closely measures, we'd probably be okay just using 3 for pi. So our circumference is about 90 yards. Um, plus, we have these straight sides, so the total distance around the racetrack would be the 150 yards plus 150 yards for our two straight sides, plus the about 90 for these two curved sides, the semicircular, which is 390 yards. Now, if you'll remember, we rounded pi down. It's actually over 3. We rounded it down to 3. So really our answer is a little bit higher than 390, which is answer choice D, 395 yards. Elijah drove 45 miles to his job in an hour and 10 minutes in the morning. On the way home, however, traffic was much heavier and the same trip took an hour and a half. What was his average speed in miles per hour for the round trip? So first let's determine just how far Elijah went. It was 45 miles to his job and then he had to drive 45 miles back home. So he drove that 45 miles twice or 90 miles. Speed is calculated by dividing your distance by your time. So we've got his total distance. Now we need to find his total time. It says it took him an hour and 10 minutes to get to his job. So one hour and 10 minutes is a total of 60 minutes plus 10 minutes, 70 minutes. Then on the way home, 
It took him an hour and a half. So one hour, 30 minutes. Again, an hour, 60 minutes plus 30 minutes means a total of 90 minutes. And we convert it, I'm converting the time into minutes just because it makes those units easier to work with. When you've got hours and minutes together, it's easier just to bring them all into minutes, put them all in that same unit of minutes. So 70 plus 90 is 160 minutes for his total travel time. So again, to calculate his speed, we need to divide his total distance by his total time. So 90 miles divided by 160 minutes. Well, the first thing I could do to simplify this is I could cancel a zero. So now it's just 9 divided by 16, which will be a lot easier to work with. So I have 9 divided by 16. 16 doesn't go into 9 at all. That's 0, which means I'm going to need to add a decimal and a 0. 16 goes into 90 five times. So 16 times 5, 5 times 6 is 30. Carry the 3. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 3 is 8. So that's 80. We subtract and we get 10. So we need to add another 0 and bring it down. So 16 goes into 100 six times. Since it went into 16 times 5 was 80, then one more time would be 96. And then we subtract and we get 4. Add another 0, bring it down. 16 goes into 40 two times. 16 times 2 is 32. So we subtract and we get 8, add another 0, bring it down, and 16 goes into 80 five times. 16 times 5 is 80, we subtract and get 0. So that means that his speed in miles per minute would be 0.5625. But they didn't ask us for his speed in miles per minute. They asked us for his average speed in miles per hour. So now I have to convert this speed into miles per hour by multiplying it by 60, since there are 60 minutes in one hour. So if he travels this speed every minute, then we multiply by 60 to find the speed in miles per hour. So first start with your zero placeholder. Six times five is 30, so that's zero, carry the three. Six times two is 12, plus three is 15. Six times, put that in the wrong place, oops. Six times six is 36, plus one is seven, carry the three. Six times five is 30, plus three is 33. And we have one, two, three, four numbers behind the decimal. So your answer should have four numbers behind the decimal. So it's 33 and 7,500 miles per hour, which is the same as 33 and 3 fourths miles per hour, since 3 fourths and 7,500 are equal. The distance traveled by a moving object is computed from the relation distance equals rate times time, where r is the rate of travel, speed, and t is the time of travel. A major league pitcher throws a fastball at a speed of 125 feet per second. The distance from the pitching rubber to home plate is 60 and 5 tenths feet. How long, in seconds, does it take a fastball to travel this distance? Compute your answer to the nearest hundredth of a second. 
So first I'm going to pull out this formula. That's going to be very helpful in solving this problem. Distance equals the rate times the time. Now I want to take the information I was given and substitute it into this equation. So they told me the speed of the ball. And remember, speed is your rate, r. So that means I'm going to replace r with 125. Then they also gave me the distance, 60 and 5 tenths feet, which means I'm going to replace d with distance, 60 and 5 tenths. And so t is what I'm trying to find. So the t will stay there in my equation. So in order to find t, to find time, we need to solve for t by dividing both sides by 125. 125 divided by 125 is 1 times t is t. So to find our answer, we need to divide 60 and 5 tenths by 125. So I'll work it over here. 60 and 5 tenths divided by 125. So that decimal goes right there. 125 does not go into 60, but it does go into 605. So we've got 125, 250, 500, and then one more time would be 625, so that means it only goes four times. And that is 500. We subtract, and we get 105. Add another zero, bring it down. We want to see how many times 125 goes into 1,050. Well, if you'll remember that 125 times 4 was 500, then it would go twice as many times as that, so eight times. And that would give us 1,000. We subtract that and we get 50. Add another zero, bring it down. And 125 goes into 500 four times. 125 times four is 500. Subtract and you get zero. So that means that the time would be 484 thousandths seconds. But if we go back to our instructions, it said to compute your answer to the nearest hundredth, which means I need to round this to the hundredths place. The eight is in the hundredths place, and that four tells the eight to stay the same. So it's simply 48 hundredths seconds. Lauren had $80 in her savings account. When she received her paycheck, she made a deposit, which brought the balance up to $120. By what percentage did the total amount in her account increase as a result of this deposit? This is a percent increase problem, and there's a formula for that. The formula to find a percent of change is to find the amount of change, divide that by the original amount, and then multiply that amount by 100. And the reason you multiply by 100 is because when you divide, you'll get a decimal answer, and to change a decimal to a percent, you multiply by 100 or simply move the decimal two places to the right. So first we need to find our amount of change. The amount of change is found by subtracting the two amounts. So she started at $80 and her balance went up to $120. So the change is 120 minus 80, divided by the original amount. 
so what she had in her account before she made her deposit, the $80. And then we multiply that by 100. So the percent change is 120 minus 80, 40, divided by 80 times 100. To simplify this, we can first cancel a zero. So we have 4 eighths times 100. And 4 eighths can be simplified to 1 half, or since we want to change it to a percent, 5 tenths which again is equivalent to 4 eighths or 1 half. So we multiply that times 100. This is our decimal, but we want a percent. So multiplying by 100 simply moves your decimal two places to the right. And we have to fill this empty seat with a zero. So it's 50 percent. Was a 50 percent increase? Answer A. What is the area of the figure shown? Well, there are a few different ways you could approach this problem, but I'm going to show you one. And that is to first find the area of this whole rectangle, and then simply to subtract the area of this rectangle here, since that's the only part that's missing out of this large rectangle. So first, we'll find the area of the large rectangle. And the area of a rectangle is the length times the width. So the area of the large rectangle is 20 feet times 50 feet. So the area is 2 times 5 is 10, 0, 0. 1,000 feet times feet, feet squared. So the area of the large rectangle is 1,000 feet squared. Now we need to find the area of this smaller rectangle, the only part that's missing out of our large rectangle. So I'm going to label this. This is the area of the large rectangle. Now we're going to find the area of the small rectangle. So again, area is the length times the width. And we have the length and the width for our small rectangle as well. 15 feet and 6 feet. So the area is 15 feet times 6 feet. 6 times 10 is 60. 6 times 5 is 30. So 30 plus 60 is 90. Feet times feet is feet squared. So the area of this little rectangle is 90 feet squared. So to find the area of this figure, we have to subtract the area of our large rectangle, 1,000 feet squared, minus the area of that small rectangle cutout which is 90 feet squared. And 1,000 minus 90 is 910 feet squared. And that's the area of our figure. Which of the following is a solution to the inequality 4x minus 12 is less than 4. First, we should solve for x in this inequality. So we're going to add 12 to both sides, bring down our 4x, minus 12 plus 12 is 0, so that cancels, bring down our less than sign, and 4 plus 12 is 16. Then we need to divide both sides by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1 times x is x is less than 16 divided by 4 is 4. Keep in mind when solving inequalities 
that if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, you must flip the inequality symbol. In this case, we didn't have to since we didn't divide both sides by a negative number. It's all about that negative. So now we can apply these answer choices. We want to find which one of these numbers is less than 4. Is 7 less than 4? No. Is 6 less than 4? No. Is 5 less than 4? No. What about 4? Is 4 less than 4? No. If this were a less than or equal to sign, if it said x is less than or equal to 4, then yes, 4 would be a solution because 4 is equal to 4. And it only has to be 1, either less than or equal to. But in this case, it's not a less than or equal to sign. It's simply a less than sign, meaning that this number must be smaller than 4. So, our answer is E. 3 is less than 4, where 3 is a smaller number than 4. Triangle ABC is a right triangle, and angle ACB is 30 degrees. What is the measure of angle BAC? Well, the first thing I want to do is fill in this information that angle ACB is 30. ACB is this angle right here, and it's 30 degrees. So I know two out of the three angles of my triangle. And I know that the three angles of a triangle add to be 180. So that means that this 90 degree angle plus this 30 degree angle plus the measure of angle BAC right here equals 180. The first thing I need to do is combine like terms. 90 plus 30 is 120, plus the measure of angle BAC is 180 degrees. To solve for the measure of angle BAC, we need to subtract 120 from both sides. 120 minus 120 is 0. Bring down the measure of angle BAC equals 180 minus 120 is 60. So that means the measure of angle BAC is 60 degrees. The table shows the cost of renting a bicycle for one, two, or three hours. Which of the following equations best represents the data? If C represents the cost and H represents the time of rental. Since this is a multiple choice question, you could always substitute these values or substitute these values for hours into your equation and see if you get the cost. For instance, you could replace H with 1, and you have 360 or $3.60 times 1, which is 360, which is the cost for one hour. And then do the same with 2 and with 3. Because sometimes an equation will work for one set of data, but not for the other two. So you should test it on all of them. However, I'll show you how to solve this problem if it weren't multiple choice. So we're going to write our own function rule using the data. 
first, looking at hours and cost, your cost is dependent on the number of hours you rent the bike. Cost, then, is the dependent variable. And I want to focus on my dependent variable and see what kind of changes are happening. So from $3.60 to $7.20, I'm adding $3.60. From $7.20 to $10.80, I'm again adding $3.60. So I can see that the change in Y is constant, or the change in the cost in the dependent variable is constant. I want to now compare and see what's happening with my independent variable, my time. So from 1 to 2, I increase by 1. From 2 to 3, I also increase by 1. So there's a constant change in my independent, my time, as well. This tells me that there's a linear relationship here. So to write my function rule, I simply need to find my rate of change, which is the change in y divided by the change in x. And the y, that's the dependent variable, whereas x is the independent variable. And we've already established that our cost is dependent, therefore our cost is our y. And we've already found the change in y, it's $3.60. Divided by the change in x, 1. So our rate of change is simply $3.60. And that rate of change is what you're multiplying the independent variable by to get the dependent variable. So I've now found that the cost is equal to $3.60 times my independent variable of h. And then we can check and see if it works. So let's replace h with 1. $3.60 times 1 is $3.60. Try it with 2. $3.60 times 2 is $7.20. Finally, 3. $3.60 times 3 is $10.80. So that verifies that our function rule works for this situation and is correct. So answer A. Determine the midpoint of the line shown in the figure. We will use the midpoint formula to find the midpoint of this line. The midpoint formula is x1 plus x2 divided by 2 and then y1 plus y2 divided by 2. So what you're doing is you're adding your two x coordinates together from the two endpoints and dividing that sum by 2, basically finding the average of the x values, which would be the middle of the x values, and then doing the same with your y coordinates of your two endpoints. You'll add those together and then divide that sum by 2. Again, finding the average of those y coordinates or the middle of the y coordinates. So when you find the middle x-coordinate and the middle y-coordinate, you'll then have the coordinates of the midpoint. But first we need to know the coordinates of our endpoints. 
So this end point is at negative 1, 2, 3, 4, positive 1, 2, 3, 4. So these coordinates are negative 4, 4 for this end point. And this end point is at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 2. These are my x1, y1, x2, y2 coordinates. And it doesn't matter which one you label as your x1, y1, as long as you label them consistently. For instance, this could not be my x2, y1. Since this is my x2 coordinate, that means this is my y2 coordinate. And those subscripts, the 1s and the 2s, all that means is this is the first point, this is the second point. But it really doesn't matter which point is your first and which point is your second. So I just usually label them from left to right. And now all we need to do is substitute and solve. So the midpoint is x1 plus x2. So negative 4 plus 6 divided by 2. And then y1 plus y2, 4 plus negative 2 divided by 2. Now we need to simplify by adding. Negative 4 plus 6 is 2 divided by 2. 4 plus negative 2 is 2 divided by 2. And finally, we divide. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So the midpoint is 1, 1, which you can see on this graph over 1, up 1. And you know that point does look like it's right in the middle of that line. So that's our midpoint. Which of the following statements is true? A. Perpendicular lines have opposite slopes. Close, but not quite. It's missing an important word here, and that word is reciprocal. Perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes, so that is not true. B. Perpendicular lines have the same slopes. Again, not true. That would be parallel lines that have the same slope. Parallel lines are lines that never touch, never intersect. So their slopes would need to be the same so that they would never touch each other. For instance, let's say these lines had a slope of uh, 1 half. Then this line, we go up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, same thing here, up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, and that way our lines never touch. So it's parallel lines that have the same slopes. So this statement is also not true. C. Perpendicular lines have reciprocal slopes. Again, close but missing a very important word, and that is opposite. They have opposite reciprocal slopes. So this is also not true. D. Perpendicular lines have, finally, opposite reciprocal slopes. This statement is true. Perpendicular lines do have opposite reciprocal slopes. And E is also not true. It says they're unrelated. Oh, that is so not true. They definitely are related. For instance, let's just take the graph of y equals 2x and y equals negative 1 half x. These are two lines that have opposite reciprocal slopes. Opposite meaning that they have different signs. One's negative, one's positive. And reciprocal meaning that the fraction is flipped. So this slope is 2 over 1, whereas this one is negative 1 over 2. Notice how the fraction is flipped. So first I'll graph y equals 2x. Let me put some marks on my graph here. So y equals 2x, we would go up 2 over 1. And y equals negative 1 half x, 
down, oh, okay, sorry, we could actually graph a line here. It's going through the origin because there is no y-intercept. So there is that line, the y equals 2x line. And then y equals negative 1 half x, again, would also go through the origin since it has no y-intercept. And from there, we would go down 1 and over 2. So you can see how these lines intersect each other at right angles because they have opposite reciprocal slopes. The Charleston Recycling Company collects 50,000 tons of recyclable material every month. The chart shows the kinds of materials that are collected by the company's five trucks. Approximately how much paper is recycled every month? This pie chart is a total of 100%. And it's a total 100% of 50,000 tons. So this 40% means 40% of the total. Paper is 40%. So 40% of the total amount of recyclable material collected, or 50,000 tons, 40% of that is paper. And that's what we want to find is how much is that? Well, of means to multiply. And I'm going to multiply 40% and 50,000, which means I need to change 40% to a decimal. So move the decimal two places to the left. So I'm actually multiplying 4 tenths or 40 hundredths, it's the same thing, times 50,000. So we have 50,000 times 4 tenths. 4 times 0 is 0, 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 and 4 times 5 is 20. We have one number behind the decimal, so our answer should have one number behind the decimal, and we get 20,000 tons. So 20,000 tons of the total 50,000 tons of recyclable material is paper. Dorothy is half her sister's age. She will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. How many years old is she? We have two unknowns here. We don't know Dorothy's age, and we don't know her sister's age. So I'm going to make up two variables for this. I'm going to use D for Dorothy's current age. And I'll use S for the sister's current age. And I say current because they're talking about um, their ages now and then also their ages in 20 years. But what we want to know is how many years old she is now. So we're going to deal with their current ages. So first we have that Dorothy is, and is in math means equals. It's one of my favorite words. I love the equal sign. So Dorothy is, Dorothy equals half her sister's age, so half s. So it's kind of like translating. You're translating from words into mathematical equations. The next sentence says she will be, so Dorothy, will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. So Dorothy in 20 years will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. Remember that D and S were Dorothy and her sister's current ages. 
So when they talk about in 20 years, that means we have to add 20 to their current age. So Dorothy's age in 20 years, so plus 20, will be or equals three-fourths of her sister's age also in 20 years. So we want to solve for Dorothy's age, obviously, um, and we can do this in lots of different ways. But the first thing I notice is that since I know that D is one-half S, I can replace D in this equation with one-half S, and that's called substitution. So that's the method I'm going to use. I'm going to replace D with one-half S plus 20 equals three-fourths times the quantity S plus 20. Well, from here we have lots of options for solving. And the first thing I think about is, um, really I just want to get rid of this fraction, this three-fourths. So I think I'll start by distributing the three-fourths to what's inside my parentheses. So I have one half s plus 20 is equal to three fourths s plus, and then with the three fourths and the 20, I can put 20 over one, and I can simplify multiplying these numbers by cross canceling four and 20. I'm simply multiplying two fractions together so I can use this shortcut. I'm going to divide both 4 and 20 by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1, and 20 divided by 4 is 5. So 3 times 5 is 15. 3 fourths of 20 is 15. That makes sense. Okay, so we need to get all of our variables on the same side. So to do that, I'm going to subtract 1 half s from both sides. 1 half s minus 1 half s is 0. I'm going to bring down 20, and that equals. Now, to subtract fractions, I have to have common denominators. So 1 half is also 2 fourths. So I'm going to change 1 half to 2 fourths so that I can subtract these. And then when I subtract, you just subtract the numerators. 3 minus 2 is 1 and your denominators stay the same, 1 fourth s plus 15. Next, I need to subtract 15 from both sides. 20 minus 15 is 5, and 5 is a fourth of the sister's age. So finally, I need to multiply both sides by the multiplicative inverse of a fourth, which is 4 over 1, or just 4. So multiply both sides by 4. 4 times 5 is 20, and 20 is her sister's age. A fourth of 4 is 1, so we're left with S, the sister's age. Well, remember that Dorothy is half of her sister's age, so since we now know her sister's age is 20, we know that Dorothy is half of that, and half of 20 is 10. So that means Dorothy is 10 years old. You could have solved this also by just kind of playing with the numbers, playing with the answers, and seeing which ones would work with the information you were given. But I always love to solve a good algebra problem. Chan receives a bonus from his job. He pays 30% in taxes, gives 30% to charity, and uses another 25% to pay off an old debt. He has $600 remaining from his bonus. What was the total amount of Chan's bonus? First, I want to start with totaling the percentage that he spent or used, the percentage that is not left. So he pays 30% in taxes, gives 30% to charity, and uses the 25% to pay off an old debt. So that's a total of 85% that 
that he has used, which means he had 15% left. And the $600 is the 15% of his total. $600 is 15% of the total amount of his bonus. 600 is as equals, change the percent to a decimal, of means to multiply, and we don't know the total, so use a variable, like t. And now we just need to solve for t. So divide both sides by 1,500. So 600 divided by 15 hundredths. We need to move the decimal two places to the right. So we do the same to 600, add two zeros, and 15 goes into 60 four times. 15 times four is 60. You subtract and get zero. When you bring down zero, 15 goes into zero, zero times, and that's just gonna keep happening two more times until we get 4,000. So what was the total amount of Chan's bonus? $4,000. A tire on a car rotates 500 RPM or revolutions per minute. When the car is traveling at 50 kilometers per hour, what is the circumference of the tire in meters? Well, the first thing I wanna do is take this 50 kilometers per hour and convert it into meters, since that's what they want the circumference in. So to convert kilometers to meters, I multiply it by the conversion factor of 1,000 meters is one kilometer. And when I multiply these fractions, I can cross cancel these units, kilometers, and I'll be left with meters per hour. And I'll go ahead and do that first. So our kilometers cross cancel, 50 times 1,000 is 50,000 meters per one hour. So every hour, this car goes 50,000 meters. And we know that it goes 500 revolutions every minute. So then I wanna convert my 50,000 meters per hour into meters per minute so I can more easily compare it to my revolutions per minute. So I'll multiply it by the conversion factor of one hour is 60 minutes. So again, my hours cross cancel since I'm multiplying fractions and I get 50,000 meters every 60 minutes. What I want to find though is what one revolution is. How many meters is one revolution? Because one revolution is one time all the way around the tire. And that would be the circumference which is what they're asking me for. So I'm gonna take this 50,000 meters per 60 minutes and multiply it times my 500 revolutions per minute. So every one minute, the car goes 500 revolutions. So that again, my minutes, these units, minutes cross cancel. 
And I can cross cancel my 50,000 and my 500 by dividing them both by 500. And 500 divided by 500 is 1. And 50,000 divided by 500 is 100. So then 100 meters times 1 is 100 meters divided by 60 revolutions. So now I found that every 100 meters, this car, it, it's going 60 revolutions every 100 meters, which I can then simplify by canceling out the zeros and I get 10 sixth meters per revolution. So it goes 10 sixth of a meter every revolution. And again, a revolution is one time all the way around the reel, which is the circumference. So our circumference is 10 sixth. A combination lock uses a three-digit code. Each digit can be any of the ten available integers, zero through nine. How many different combinations are possible? In this probability problem, there are three independent events. Independent meaning they don't affect each other. So to find the possible outcomes, we would have to find the product of the possible outcomes for these three independent events. So the possible outcomes would be first the possible outcomes for the first digit, 10, since there are 10 available numbers, times the possible outcomes for the second digit, which again is 10, 10 integers, times the possible outcomes for the third digit which is again 10. So the probability is 10, or the, the possible outcomes is 10 times 10, which is 100, times 10, which is 1,000 possible in outcomes. This is the quicker way to do it. Of course, you can always see by actually writing the combinations. 0, 0, 0 would be the first. Then 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 4, 5, 6, etc., all the way up to 9, 9, 9, which makes it seem like there are 999 possible outcomes. But really, we have to count this first one, the 0, 0, 0, which gives us the total of 1,000 possible outcomes. Which of the following expressions is equivalent to the quantity a plus b times the quantity a minus b? Well, this is actually a rule that you would memorize, but you don't have to memorize it. You can always just take these binomials and multiply them together using FOIL. The F stands for first, meaning to multiply the first terms in each set of parentheses. So A times A. And A times A is A squared. Then O stands for outer or outside. So you multiply the two terms on the outsides, or A and negative B. So A times negative b is negative a b. i stands for inner or inside. So you multiply the two terms on the inside, b and a. b times a is b a or a b, so plus a b. And finally, the l stands for last. So you multiply the two terms that are in the last positions of each set of parentheses. Positive b times negative b 
which is negative b squared. Then to simplify, we combine like terms. Negative ab and positive ab are like terms, and they cancel each other out because they're additive inverses of each other, or opposites. So we're left with a squared minus b squared, or answer a. Which of the following expressions represents the ratio of the area of a circle to its circumference? We've got some pretty key words here. The first one I see is ratio. A ratio is a comparison of two numbers, like a fraction. And what we're comparing is the area of a circle to its circumference. Well, the area of a circle is pi times radius squared, while the circumference of a circle is 2 times pi times radius. So the area is going to be our numerator, since it was listed first, area to circumference, means that the area should be in the numerator, divided by this 2 is your division bar, the circumference, 2 times pi times radius. And then we need to simplify. First I see that pi divided by pi cancels. Pi divided by pi is 1. Anything divided by itself is 1. So we can cancel it. And then I can simplify r squared divided by r. When you divide, you subtract the exponents. Or another way to think about it is r squared is r times r. And I'm dividing that by r. So again, you have something divided by itself is 1 or it cancels. So I'm left with just r in the numerator divided by 2 in the denominator since those r's canceled. So we just have r divided by 2, which is answer e. Jesse invests $7,000 in a certificate of deposit that pays interest at the rate of 7.5% annually. How much interest in dollars does Jesse gain from this investment during the first year that he holds the certificate? This is a great problem to use this formula on. And some people call it IPERT, just as a way to remember it. The I stands for the interest, the amount of interest in dollars, like what we're trying to find. P stands for principal, or the amount that's being invested initially. That would be our $7,000. The R is the rate, or the percentage, but written as a decimal. So we're going to take 7.5% and write it as a decimal. And that'll be our rate. And then T stands for time. So you may want to make a note of that. This I is the interest. P is the principal. R is the rate as a decimal. And the T is the time. So we're going to take our information from our problem and plug it in. So our amount of interest is equal to the principal, $7,000, times the rate as a decimal again. So we're taking 7.5% and changing it to a decimal, which means taking the decimal and moving it two places to the left. So you add that zero, so it's 75 thousandths, and then times the year, or the time, and um, we're just trying to find out about the first year, so that means it's been in there for one year, and then we just need to multiply those things together. So one times anything is just that, so I can really kind of ignore that, so I just need to multiply these two numbers together, 
So I have this 75 thousandths, and I'm going to put it on top because it's very easy to multiply times 7,000 since the first thing I'm going to do is just write down those three zeros. And then the only number I really have to multiply by is the 7. So 7 times 5 is 35. Write the 5, carry the 3. 7 times 7 is 49, plus 3 is 52. And then we have three numbers behind the decimal, so three numbers behind the decimal. And that means that he's going to make $525 off of his investment. So that's the number you would need to bubble in is 525. In an election in Kimball County, candidate A obtained 36,800 votes. His opponent, candidate B, obtained 32,100 votes. 2,100 votes went to write-in candidates. What percentage of the votes went to candidate A? To find a percent, we need the part over the whole. And we know the part. The part is the number of votes candidate A received, which is 36,800. What I need to know is the whole, or the total number of votes. To find the total number of votes, we need to add up 36,800, 32,100, and 2,100, so that we can find the total. So we're adding. Those are 0, and again we get 0. Then we have 8, 9, 10, so that's a 0. Carry the 1. We have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Carry the 1. And we have 3, 6, 7. So that means there were a total of 71,000 votes. Now to find our percent, we need to divide. That'll give us our decimal, which will then change into a percent. But before I divide, I'm going to first simplify this fraction by canceling two zeros. And now my division will be a lot easier. So we need to divide 368 by 710. Well, 710 doesn't go into 368 at all, which means I'm going to have to add a decimal and a zero. And now I can divide 710 into 3,680. So I can use compatible numbers here, and 710 is very close to 700. 700 times 5 would be 3,500. So I'm thinking 710 is going to go about five times into 3,680. So let me multiply this. We get zero, and that's five, and that's 35. So 3,550. Yep, looks good. So that's five. We have 3,550. Now we need to subtract, and that's zero, three, one, so 130. Then we need to add a zero and bring it down, 1,300. So 710, and um, it's only going to go into 1,300 one time because 700 plus 700 would be 1,400, and that's too much. So it's just one time. 710 times 1 is 710. Then we need to subtract. So I'm going to borrow from the 1, that's a 0, that's 13. Borrow from the 13, that's 12, which makes that 10. And we'll borrow, well, we don't need to borrow that 0. So 10 minus 1 is 9, and 12 minus 7 is 5, 590, which makes sense. If you add 90 back to 710, you get 800. And if you add 500 to 800, you get the 1300. So we need to add another 0 and bring it down. 
So now we need to know how many times 710 goes into 5,900. So I'm again going to use that compatible number of 700. So let's see, 700 times um, 8 would be 5,600. So I'm thinking it goes in there about 8 times. So that's 0, and that's 8, and that's 56. So yes, that's very close. So that's 8. And we have 5680. We can subtract, and that's 0. Borrow from the 9, that's an 8, so that's 10. 10 minus 8 is 2. 8 minus 6 is 2, so we get 220. And we could keep going, but really, that's all I need to know, because as I look at my answers, it's very clear which one of these is my answer. This is, well, it's about... 518 thousandths, and then when we change it into our percent, we move our decimal two places to the right, we get 51 and 8 tenths percent, which is answer A. Francine can ride 16 miles on her bicycle in 45 minutes. At this speed, how many minutes would it take Francine to ride 60 miles. This problem is a good candidate for using a proportion to solve. There's more than one way to solve it, but I like proportion, so I'm going to use a proportion. First, I know that Francine can go 16 miles in 45 minutes. That's going to be my first ratio. So I have 16 miles in 45 minutes. And the key to setting up a successful proportion is to be consistent. So since our first ratio, we have miles to minutes, then our second ratio will also be miles to minutes. So they want to know how many minutes it would take Francine to ride 60 miles. So my miles is 60, and my minutes is what I'm trying to find so that's where I'll put a variable. To solve a proportion, we cross multiply. 16 times x is 16x, and that equals 60 times 45, 0. 6 times 5 is 30, carry the 3. 6 times 4 is 24, plus 3 is 27. So 2,700. And then we solve for x by dividing both sides by 16. So x equals, and now I need to find out what 2,700 divided by 16 is. 16 goes into 2,700 one time. And that's 16, and we subtract and get 11. Then we bring down our zero. We could use 15 as a compatible number to see how many times 15 would go into 110. So we have 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, 105. So seven times. So let's see if 16 will go into 110 seven times. 7 times 6 is 42, 7 times 1 is 7, plus 4 is 11. And that's a little too big, which means I know 16 goes into 110 six times. So 16 times 6, 6 times 6 is 36, 6 times 1 is 6, plus 3 is 9. And that works. So we need to subtract. And we get 14. Then we bring down our next zero. So we have 140. So I know 16 is going to go into 140 at least seven times, but it should go even more than that. So let's see what 16 times 8 is. 8 times 6 is 48. 8 times 1 is 8 plus 4 is 12. And that's all we're going to be able to do. So 
8 times and we get 128. And when we subtract those numbers, we get 12. So that means we need to add a decimal and a zero and bring it down. 16 goes into 120 seven times. 16 times 7, we found earlier, is 112. So we subtract and we get 8. We add another 0 and bring it down. And 16 goes into 80 less than 6 times and actually exactly 5 times. 16 times 5 is 80. So we subtract and we get a remainder of 0. So that means if it took her 45 minutes to go 16 miles, it should take her 168 and 75 hundredths minutes to go 60 miles. And this is the answer you would grid in. Figure 9 shows two quarter circles centered on the origin of the Cartesian coordinate plane. The inner circle has a radius of two units. The outer circle has a radius of three units. What is the area of the shaded region? So that's right in here. And so if you can just imagine it, this circle would continue going as would this larger circle. So since it's been split into quarters, all we're finding the area of is a quarter of those circles. So first let's start with what the formula for the area of a circle is. It's pi times radius squared. As we discussed though, this is only a quarter of the circle, so our area is a quarter of the area of, this, of these circles. So, um, and then we need to find the area of just the part between those two circles. So that would be the area of the large circle minus the area of the small circle. And the area of the large circle would be pi times the radius, which is 3 squared, minus the area of the small circle, which would be pi times 2 squared. And the 3 and the 2 came from the radius. The radius um, of the small circle is 2, and the radius of the outer circle has a radius of 3. So that's where these name numbers came from. And now let's simplify that. So we get area is a fourth of 3 squared is 9, so 9 pi minus 2 squared is 4, so 4 pi. Now since each one of these terms has a pi in it, we can factor the pi out. So we get area equals a fourth pi times the quantity 9 minus 4. And then we can simplify 9 minus 4, so we have area equals a fourth pi times 5. And a fourth times 5 is 5 fourths, so that's 5 fourths pi. But of course, if you're needing to bubble this in on an answer sheet, then you don't have the option of bubbling pi. So um, we're going to have to multiply 5 fourths times pi. And 5 fourths times pi is 1 and 25 hundredths pi. And for pi, we'll just use 3 and 14 hundredths. So we're doing 1 and 25 hundredths times 3 and 14 hundredths, and that I'm going to do over here. So 3 and 14 hundredths times 1 and 25 hundredths, and that's my pi. 5 times 4 is 20, 5 times 1 is 5, that's 7, 5 times 3 is 15. Put a zero placeholder, 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6. Put two zero placeholders. 1 times 4 is 4. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 3 is 3. Add that together. That's 0. 7 plus 8 is 15. Carry the 1. 
5, 9, 10, 12, carry the 1, 6, 7, 8, 9, 3. Uh, and then we have four numbers behind the decimal. One, two, three, four numbers behind the decimal. So, and then we could round this to three and ninety-three hundredths would be the area of just the shaded region. The figure shows an irregular quadrilateral and the lengths of its individual sides. Which of the following equations best represents the perimeter of the quadrilateral? The perimeter is the distance around a figure. To find the perimeter of any shape, you can simply add all of the sides. So the perimeter is m plus 3 plus m plus 2 plus m plus 2m. And now we just need to combine like terms. So the perimeter is m plus m plus m plus 2m so that's 1, 2, 3 m's plus 2 m's is a total of 5 m's plus 3 plus 2 is 5. So the perimeter is 5 m plus 5. Answer D. David bought 200 shares of Oracle stock yesterday and sold it today. His profit was $22. At what price did he buy the stock yesterday? And we have this table of information to use. So we're only focusing on Oracle stock, which presently is being sold for $19.11 per share. It tells us that he bought 200 shares and made a profit of $22. So the first thing we want to do is find out his profit per share, which means we need to divide his profit by his number of shares. 200 does not go into 22, so I have to add a decimal and a zero. Now 200 will divide into 220. 200 goes into 220 one time. And 200 times 1 is 200. We subtract and we get 20. So we add another 0 and bring it down. 200 goes into 200 one time. 200 times 1 is 200. We subtract and we get 0. Now we know that he made 11 cents per share. If today's price per share is $19.11, then we have to subtract his profit to find out how much he bought them for the day before. So $19.11 minus 11 cents would just be $19. Answer B. Marjorie buys a package of stocks consisting of 100 shares each of Microsoft and Apple, as well as 200 shares of Garmin at today's closing prices as shown in the table. What is the average price per share that she pays for these stocks? To find this average price per share, First, I need to find the total price. Then I have to find the total shares and divide because this is a ratio, price per share. 
price divided by shares. So first I'm going to figure out how much money she spent on these shares. So she got a hundred shares of Microsoft. So let's start with Microsoft. She bought a hundred shares for forty-five dollars and fourteen cents each. So times forty-five, fourteen. And multiplying by a hundred just means you move that decimal two places to the right. So it's four thousand five hundred fourteen dollars that she spent on her Microsoft shares. She also bought a hundred shares of Apple. So a hundred times an Apple is sixteen dollars and ninety cents. And again multiplying by a hundred just means to move that decimal two places to the right. So she spent one thousand six hundred ninety dollars on her Apple shares. Then she got 200 shares of Garmin. So Garmin, 200 times. And Garmin is $29.30. So multiplying by 100 means we move it two places to the right. But multiplying by 200 means not only do we multiply our, or move our decimal two places to the right, but we're also going to double that number. So um, double, if you double zero, you get zero. If you double three, you get six. If you double nine, you get 18. And then we carry the one over here. Two times two is four plus one is five. So all I did was multiply 200 times $29.30. So I can use this then to find my total amount of money spent. I'm just going to move this up a little so I have some more room. So I'm going to add these three costs together to find my total cost or my total price. So 4 plus 0 plus 0 is 4. 1 plus 9 is 10 plus 6 is 16. And then we have 8 plus 6 is 14, plus 5 is 19, plus 1 is 20. 5 plus 1 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 2 is 12. So that means she spent a total of $12,064 on all of these stocks. That's our price. Now we need to find our shares. And that total can be found right here. Just add these up. 200 plus 100 plus 100. That's a total of 400 shares. So the average price per share would be $12,064 divided by 400 shares. So all we have to do is divide those two numbers. Four hundred goes into twelve hundred six three times. Four hundred times three is twelve hundred. Subtract and you get six. Bring down the four. Four hundred does not go into sixty four at all, so that's a zero, which means we add a decimal and a zero and bring it down. Four hundred goes into six hundred forty one time. So bring that decimal up. One times 400 is 400. And then you subtract and you get 240. Add another zero. Bring it down. And 400 goes into 2400 six times. 400 times six is 2400. You subtract and you get a remainder of zero. Which means the average price per share is thirty dollars and sixteen cents. Pradeep decides to invest four thousand five hundred dollars in Cisco System stock and buys it at the price shown in the table. 
at what price should he sell it to obtain a profit of 10%? So he's buying Cisco Systems stock at $3.50 per share. If he wants to make a profit of 10%, then he needs to sell his stock when the price per share is 10% higher. And there are several ways to solve this problem. I'll show you one. So first I want to know, what is 10% of $3.50? Well, of means to multiply. So I'm multiplying times one-tenth, or times ten-hundredths. And multiplying times ten-hundredths means just moving that decimal one place to the left. So that is thirty-five hundredths, or thirty-five cents. So that means that his stock needs to be thirty-five cents higher. The price per share needs to be thirty-five cents greater. So $3.50 plus 35 cents is $3.85. So in order to make a profit, a 10% profit, then he needs to sell his stock at $3.85 per share.